so I'm very glad to welcome you here in this panel about media freedom in Europe. Yeah, here you are. Um, as you might know, I hope that everybody of you knows that we will be using English as uh, language. See? Do Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm Chiara Sigele from Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso. I'll be introducing the position paper that we will then like to discuss with our discussant. I have the pleasure to have here with me our rapporteur, Denise Yazici. I hope I pronounce your name properly. She is uh, of the OSCE uh, representative of Media Freedom Office. Uh, she is advisor of Dunja Mijatovic and she will take notes of our discussion and she, uh, she will bring the outcomes of our discussion into the closing round table. What I will be presenting is a draft position paper that will be then uh, integrated with all our um, comments and discussion and published on Osservatorio uh, website next week. So. Um, I would like, since the place here is not that big, I will call our discussant one after the other, or maybe two, uh, two people and then two people and so on. We'll have more or less 10 minutes. It would be nice if we could stick a little bit uh, in a shorter time, um, so as to have a little bit room for discussion later. Uh, now, I just need to take my mobile so that I can check the time. Okay, we have 40 minutes late, so <laughs> it's going to be quite challenging. So let's start. The EU has consistently recognized media freedom and pluralism as fundamental pillars of democratic systems, enshrining these principles in EU binding documents. As far as enlargement countries are concerned, Commission and Han recently stated that media freedom is an imperative and that without freedom of the media, a country cannot be part of the EU. Despite this, both in member states and in the countries aspiring to join the EU, media independence and safety of journalists are often under pressure by means of direct and indirect threats. Taking a closer look at the situation, Freedom House warns that Europe registered the world's second largest net decline in media freedom since 2004, a deterioration which is second only to Eurasia. Such deterioration can be attributed to the incremental erosion of the legal and economic environments, the product of several trends, including the digital evolution and negative factors such as the economic crisis and the securitarian turn that further facilitate the interference with the ability of journalists to cover the news in person. Journalists face the abuse of legal actions for defamation, both, but the EU has no direct power to intervene on member states' national regulations over this matter. Along with the misuse of criminal and civil defamation laws, increased risk for freedom of the media also derive for the abuse of anti-terrorism, anti-extremism and anti-blasphemy laws even more so today, with the fear of jihadist terrorism spreading across Europe and favoring a climate of witch hunt against minorities, refugees and migrants. Moreover, as shown in the discussion in the European Parliament around the Directive on Trade Secret, restrictions to journalists, um, access to information of public relevance can be introduced even by means of copyright norms. So evidence of important chilling effects also results from legal issues connected with managing digital broadcasting and online content, for example, comment section or social media management, as well as from the introduction of new laws on the right to be forgotten and on the related responsibilities of service providers. As far as member states are concerned, EU institutions have a limited scope of intervention as media are mostly regulated at the state level and the EU Charter for Fundamental Rights only apply to member states when they are implementing EU law. The Commission can only intervene on media issue when other areas of the EU are concerned, like competition law. The Commission can further monitor the situation and prompt governments as well as empower domestic actors to work for media freedom and pluralism at home. On the other hand, 
In the countries aspiring to join the EU, the Commission has been increasing its level capacity in the field of media freedom. Moving on from the experience of recent enlargements, media freedom and pluralism enjoy a higher centrality in the current negotiations, also thanks to the introduction of new soft laws, such as the 2013 guidelines on EU support to media in the enlargement countries. The leverage capacity of the current enlargement policy may certainly be improved, first and foremost by going beyond the current checklist approach to ensure effective implementation and conditions for journalists to remain objective and professional, for example through the independence of public service and regulatory bodies and workers, workers right, that are not considered in progress reports. Furthermore, while progress reports assign homework for central institutions in candidate countries, these do not diminish the effort to be done at the level of public opinion. However insufficient one may consider the criteria set forth in EU conditionality and checked list in progress reports, even these incentives ceases to exist once a country joins the EU, meaning that there are no progress reports for member states. The experience with new member states confirms that media freedoms tend to be harshly challenged after membership is obtained. At the same time, political pressure, economic hardship, physical attacks against journalists, restrictive legislation and economic crisis are important challenges to media freedom and pluralism in EU member states too. Threats to media freedom are a shared concern as Europe is a common information space which needs a free, well-informed and lively European public sphere to debate common challenges and solutions. Looking at the whole picture, country-specific problems are paralleled by shared challenges. The media sector is undergoing similar structural changes worldwide that make old arrangements no longer tenable with old business models becoming outdated due to technological and online developments. Increasing concentration of media ownership leads to oligopolies that undermine media pluralism. Editorial independence is constantly in danger as a consequence of a well-known alliance between political and economic powers that uses opaque methods uh, of distribution of government advertisement as a disciplinary mechanism. This vicious coalition, coupled with worsening labor conditions for journalists, make censorship redundant, relying instead on self-censorship and the forced erosion of professional standards. In addition, media freedom, notwithstanding the deluge of declaration, is not a compelling political priority yet, as it very easily slips back in the agenda of EU institutions and European countries when other matters, such as stability and security, are at stake. Media freedom and journalists' independence are even more severely curtailed when crises arise, as shown by recent developments inside and outside the EU. Indeed, the attempt at seizing independent media in times of crisis is a testimony to the crucial role of media in the democratic process and explains why political and economic powers try to protect their legitimacy by controlling journalism. Although it usually garners increased attention only when media freedom is seriously undermined, the erosion of media freedom is a long-term process resulting from pernicious, often hidden strategies coupling economic and political power. Hence, the need for equally long-term strategies to fight back. Most notably, an action plan enabling journalism to break this chain of control is needed in order to create the legal, economic and social conditions for free and pluralistic media environments. An essential step in this direction is to improve the working condition of journalists, also by identifying new business models for quality journalism as a prerequisite to make them less vulnerable to political pressure in the form of economic blackmailing. On the other side, journalists also need to regain public trust, an asset which has faded away in, the lease in these last years because of poor journalistic standards. 
This is especially, though not exclusively, true for EU candidate countries, where pro-government outlets often orchestrate smear campaigns against prominent civil society actors and independent media. Thus, if the decriminalization of defamation is a must, it is also urgent to ensure that the judiciary has the required independence, knowledge and skills to ensure that there is no selective justice in media-related lawsuits and that those enacting smear campaigns, be it trolls or media outlets serving political and economic powers, are adequately sanctioned. As pointed out by our previous safety net project, there is an urgent need to restore the missing link between the rights of journalists to do their work safely and the right of citizens to receive quality information. A renewed alliance between journalists and citizens is a precondition for future improvements and requires to re-establish awareness of the role media play in our democratic society. This task demands journalism, transnational information, sorry, aimed at raising awareness in the European public opinions about the challenges journalism faces and the mechanism through which media are seized and controlled. An effort which grassroots and virtuous journalism joining forces across European borders can actively and certainly aid. Finally, if we agree that a stronger EU competence in the field should emerge, we should work on the side of policymakers too, both at the domestic and international level, and nurture the debate in the European public sphere on the need to support those actively promoting free and pluralistic media at the European level. An increased public awareness of the watchdog role of the media would be beneficial to this goal as well. So, um, this is uh, our uh, input for discussion. Uh, and now I would like to invite our first discussant to join me here. Um, and I would start with Evren Gönül. Uh, all the discussants that we are inviting here uh, are journalists or media experts, and the journalists are our partner within this ECPMF project. We are currently um, managing together with the um, ECPMF in Lipsia and other partners. So, Evren, the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Chiara. Um, so, uh, I'm, f I'm from Turkey, uh, and uh, I'm representing IPS Communication Foundation, which is, uh, which is a foundation which tries to promote free and alternative journalism in Turkey, which is outside of the mainstream. Uh, and uh, since 15 years, we are trying to uh, broadcast a news portal, uh, organize some capacity buildings uh, activities such as internships and summer schools. And the uh, final layer of our efforts is about the f uh, freedom of expression in Turkey, which we try to monitor and report quarterly uh, since 10 years. Uh, so, just before beginning, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, I have been invited to, to, a several, uh, to several regional meetings uh, about journalism uh, in the last two months. Uh, and uh, almost all of them uh, here, uh, uh, Mihaela also knows uh, some of them, uh, almost all of them, without a, without a single exception, as I remember, uh, concluded with the same call, uh, which is we need solidarity. Uh, yes, I agree with that, and I'm sure you agree as well. But uh, the thing is that we must go beyond that uh, this this kind of descriptive framings uh, framing so uh, and take action uh, I therefore would like to thank the observatory to uh, for producing such a dynamic uh, position paper so um, Turkey is in the uh, in RSF's Freedom of Expression uh, Index, Turkey ranks it 
in 149. Uh, so as you might guess, there are some problems with Turkish uh, journalism, uh, environment and climate. So uh, resonating with what our position paper here suggests, I will just list some of them. So uh, concentration of media ownership is a major problem as as all the regional uh, journalistic uh, efforts and activities. Uh, limitations to editorial independence, restrictive le legislation and judicial shortcomings. And uh, one of the major issues uh, I would like to call it as well is the low degree of unionization and uh, weak internal uh, regulations in the realm of media. So uh, this position paper is points uh, to the point uh, is to the point and reflects uh, a majority of our problems in Turkey. Uh, what are the recent uh, developments in Turkey? As you know, we had an election, and we had another one because the uh, government couldn't get the majority of the parliament and uh, they did not want to uh, cancel, uh, diminish their uh, parliamentary force, uh, so they still get the majority uh, in the parliament with the second election. And since 2002 it, is this, it was the same. So it is a part of this authoritarianism, uh, which is a global tendency, or, or at least regional uh, trend. Uh, so the results are uh, results for journalists are uh, much more repressive um, climates uh, for free journalism, investigative journalism, uh, and uh, freedom of expression. Uh, the, this paper uh, suggests one concrete thing that I, I would like to uh, elaborate on, <coughs> which is to to create some uh, new models, some new business models for free journalism and uh, journalistic uh, production. Uh, BNN, our news portal, is one of uh, one example from Turkey. Um, um, of such such alternative models because it is relatively protected against uh, against the compulsions of state and the market. Uh, although it hasn't uh, a stable stable uh, financial uh, sustainability because we are working on European uh, Commission's funds uh, and uh, Swedish uh, funds, uh, so we are we cannot get any profit. Uh, Um, th there are some numbers I would like to share. Maybe it will also inform our discussion here. Uh, currently, there are 24 journalists in jail and uh, nine distributors. <coughs> and most of them, a majority of them, are from Kurdish media. Um, so apart from terrorism, most of them are prosecuted under the uh, allegations of denigration, defamation, obscenity, subversion, uh, insulting Turkishness and religious, uh, religion. So uh, our paper promptly summarizes uh, its respective suggestions under, under the uh, title Desc Decriminalization of Defamation and Independence of <coughs> Judiciary. Um, So, uh, cont continuing with the numbers, um, uh, according to most uh, current statistics, uh, there are more than 100,000 websites <coughs> currently restricted or banned in Turkey. Um, another alarming statistical information, um, just in the second half of 2014, uh, 87% of the requests globally for Twitter content removing came from Turkey. So this is, this is very 
Um, for me. <coughs> Just to summarize the, uh, the, the whole story, the government is trying to impede any voice, any oppositional voice and uh, any ability of free media, free uh, journalism to account and scrutinize their activities. Uh, however, um, there, there are some spaces, open spaces, uh, that the government cannot touch <coughs> yet. Uh, <coughs> and one of them is the social media, online uh, journalistic organizations, um, and uh, all of them are informed by citizenship journalism in Turkey. Uh, and since the Gezi movement two, uh, three years ago, uh, this has been accelerated and the alternative media has proliferated uh, unprecedentedly, uh, I can say. Um, so, uh, that's all. Thank you very much, Evren. Um, also for your acknowledgement of our shared effort within this European project, you see here the, the roll-up it's uh, showing uh, and giving credits to this overall uh, transnational project we are all currently working on uh, together with uh, the lead partner in, uh, in Lipsia. Um, I would like to collect all the comments from other discussants and then maybe have some time to discuss further the inputs that uh, you are all giving. So thank you very much, and I call here Mihailo Jovovic uh, from uh, Montenegrinian um, Daily, uh, Viesti. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to talk to you today. The paper we're discussing today, in my opinion, is very good, but uh, I think it, we should add some things which are important, and I try to argue for that by the examples of, in, on, of the pressures on uh, journalists and media, media in Montenegro. So uh, we might include something of that, I hope. If not, it's still a good paper. Uh, the situation is in uh, Montenegro is, uh, in my opinion, very similar to some other countries in the region. Uh, we don't have a journalist in jail like in Turkey, but uh, it is very, uh, very stressful to, to work there. Journalists are attacked, physically threatened, uh, killed. Uh, the pro property of the media is... Uh, destroyed uh, in many cases, and most of these cases has not been solved. Uh, the direct uh, consequences of this is that uh, uh, many quality people are leaving profession completely and uh, go to, to work to in, in other professions like uh, PR or, you know, they, they can't stand the pressure. Uh, but uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, 95% of the media is controlled by the government in one way on, or the other. Uh, there are few media left which are not under control of the government, and these are uh, mainstream media, which is uh, uh, a difference uh, comparing to some other countries in the region. Uh, and uh, these media, in my opinion, are playing the watchdog role, and that's the main reason for that. Uh, uh, last year, the since last year, the attacks, physical attacks, uh, in much smaller number. Uh, also, uh, I would like to to uh, to point out to the uh, the sneaky ways of uh, uh, influencing the media and try to uh, try to the government try try to uh, silence the, these critical voices. And by the way, it's not only the media, but also the civil society, which is uh, very strong in Montenegro. And uh, it's obvious to, who, to whoever who wants to see uh, uh, what's, what's going on. 
uh, the one of the, the sneaky ways is through government advertising. I, I didn't notice that it was mentioned in the uh, in the in the paper. Uh, and uh, what we argue and uh, sh point out to all the, all the people we talk to, and also uh, doing it in in, uh, in in our media, is for to 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 pressure the, the European Commission, which has influence. Uh, uh, to, to get to the government of Montenegro and other governments when this is not applied, to have the criteria by which the state advertising is uh, distributed to, to the media, because that's one of the main tools that uh, the governments try to stifle the, the media they don't like, and at the same time uh, finance the media that follow their line, that are basically their mouthpiece pieces. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the, the part of the paper where they say that uh, pr media, the, the smear campaign is very, smear campaigns are waged in the in this media against the, the, the professional media and the civil society. That's uh, one of the major is issues also in uh, uh, in Montenegro. Uh, that tells me that uh, the main goal of the government is to, to try to destroy the credi credibility of those people. So they won't influence the, the public opinion, which, uh, which is uh, uh, sometimes it looks like it's turning against the government. By the way, we have the same government, government in Montenegro for 25 years now. So it's uh, another difficulty. <laughs> uh, uh, also, the court cases uh, are an issue. Uh, the courts are not independent, as, as the most institutions in Montenegro are still uh, uh, empty shells uh, ruled by the, this parallel system which uh, rules the country, made of some government people, mafia and uh, shady business. Uh, so that's another way of influencing the, the journalists to be uh, to to apply self-censorship and uh, carefully think not only in the way of professional standards, but what this uh, dependent judiciary can do if, if somebody gets you to court, and it's usually the public officials which, which sue you. Uh, another issue which I didn't notice in the paper is access to information. Uh, which is, uh, I presume, uh, and I, I can confidently say that uh, all of these countries in the region have good laws on the, on the access to information, but uh, uh, there's no, uh, they're not applied properly. Uh, recently, there was a, a fact in the analysis of the, this request that 50% of the, of the request for information. Uh, uh, which go to, f to further to upper instances is uh, because of the administration didn't give you any answers to, to the request. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to share a story with you. Uh, for six or seven months now, we, we are asking the Ministry of Agriculture who spent, uh, who spent 48 euros uh, on uh, cigarillos uh, paid by the the ministry's uh, card, which u is used for buying the fuel, and uh, every Thursday we we print a story on the front page, not the main story, but we print a story who smoked on the on the expense of the taxpayers, and uh, we we took them to the agency, which should decide about that and. Uh, we took them to the court, and they still uh, still uh, didn't tell us who spent that money. Uh, so uh, this is a very important thing, uh, and uh, all of us uh, and uh, our network and uh, should should pressure all the governments and uh, even the even the European Commission and the EU other institutions. Uh, to 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 make this uh, more conditional for the for further progress uh, into EU. Uh, also, uh, another thing is the support, the the, the real concrete support uh, that uh, uh, I think that EU should give to these uh, professional media who, who who do the work as a as a watch, watchdog. Uh, it used to be common in the 90s when, when uh, 
uh, several media were supported through these schemes uh, uh, during the wars in the Balkans. And uh, I think the time, that, that time has come back. Uh, and uh, what I often tell to, to people I talk from the European Union, uh, we might uh, eventually, and also, also it's, it's their fault uh, sometimes because they often, although they, they talk uh, more harshly about uh, the freedom of the media as a condition to, to go further, uh, they uh, very often forget that and then trade that for something else uh, that they needed more. Uh, and uh, so what I, told, what I tell them often is uh, that, for example, Montenegro should uh, become a member of the Re European Union, but without a free media, if they continue like that. They should put the, put the money where the mouth is. Thank you. Thank you, Mihailo. Um, just a technical question. If we use this micro, will it be recorded? Okay, fine. Um, as for the final position paper, we will also publish online the recordings uh, of the proceedings, so uh, just to have a documentation of this uh, workshop. Many thanks for such concrete suggestion. We will for sure include it in the final paper and also we will keep them in mind for our further work. So now I would like to call here with me Stojana Georgieva of uh, Mediapol Bulgaria and then after her, Anna Kuzmanic from H. Alter in Croatia. Hello, I'm Stojana Gurgieva, I'm from Bulgaria. I'm running uh, Mediapool.bg, it is uh, online daily. Um, maybe the oldest uh, in uh, Bulgaria. It was, uh, it was the first uh, online uh, news outlet in Bulgaria started uh, uh, 15 or 16, 16 years uh, ago. Uh, so this morning uh, we have uh, discussed uh, um, problems and uh, we, we found out uh, that uh, um, most uh, of the states uh, concerned, uh, we are sharing uh, more or less one and the uh, same uh, problems. So uh, now I will introduce you with uh, some more details about the Bulgarian situation. Uh, so, <clears throat> non-transparent uh, media ownership and uh, the massive concentration uh, of uh, media outlets within a uh, few conglomerates uh, remain the weakest feature of Bulgarian media. Ownership concentration has also spread uh, into the online uh, media sphere. Uh, professional standards and uh, trust uh, in media are on decline. Uh, such conditions uh, open uh, avenues for escalating political or corporate pressure on the editorial policies of all media, uh, which subsequent, subsequently leads uh, to a steady fall in media freedom indicators by established international organizations. Bulgaria, for example, fell down from 100 to 106th place in Reporters Without Borders ranking for this year. Uh, being Bulgaria is at the bottom among EU member states. Bulgarian media are still partly free according to Freedom House ranking. In a broader context, we are witnessing now consolidation of the oligarch elite around anti-market, anti-European and uh, anti-Western, anti-American policies aiming at uh, expanding the control and influence of local business structures connected uh, to the party in power. It is uh, party GERP. Officially, it is center-right party. Uh, it is a uh, member of... Uh, uh, the, 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 the leading uh, party in European, uh, in, uh, European uh, Parliament, European People's uh, Party. And uh, the other party with uh, the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, corruption influence is the movement for rights and uh, freedoms. 
This party movement uh, for rights, rights and uh, freedoms uh, is a very particular case. Uh, it is the third uh, largest party in the parliament with uh, 38 deputies in the uh, 240 member parliament. This is the party of ethnic, uh, of, uh, ethnic Turkish uh, minority in Bulgaria, uh, which has always uh, voted for her and therefore this party is subscribed to power, notwithstanding any disclosures of corruption or abuse of power. The name of the member of parliament of this party, Mr. Delian Pevsky, stands for the behind the skin oligarch model of the government. To Bulgarian citizens, this model is known as the KOI or WHO model and uh, is uh, related to the suffocating clutch on the state affairs perpetrated by this uh, party movement for rights and freedoms and its uh, member of parliament, Mr. Pevsky, whose appointment as a chairman of the state agency for national security in June 2013 Caused the, uh, caused the most uh, massive civic protests since the fall of uh, commun communism. Uh, it was really a phenomenon in Bulgaria because in other countries uh, people are uh, struggling uh, against uh, austerity measures uh, or uh, some other. In Bulgaria it was because uh, uh, such a prominent uh, oligarch uh, in a very uh, non-transparent non uh, way uh, was uh, elected, uh, was appointed uh, as a chairman of uh, this uh, security agency. After this, uh, this, uh, after this, uh, uh, these protests, uh, which were really huge protests uh, in uh, Sofia, in the capital of Bulgaria, uh, this appointment. Uh, mm, it was uh, uh, he was removed in three day uh, in three days. Uh, this summer, Mr. Pevsky came to light as the actual owner of uh, a huge media empire, real estates, uh, key companies. Uh, probably it is imminent to reveal his participation in other companies uh, which he owns through offshore participation and uh, dummies and uh, which uh, regularly embezzle the liar share of multi-million projects funded by both the EU funds and state budget. Uh, the Financial Supervision Commission as well as the Prosecutor's Office have so far uh, persecuted media such as uh, media pool and uh, economedia because they have published materials about uh, Mr. Pevsky's uh, hidden property. Uh, his transformation into a leg legitimate oligarch becomes possible due to the support of uh, key uh, state institutions in Bulgaria. Uh, his empire was built mainly using uh, credit, huge credit, from already bankrupted private bank. Uh, what is this story for? This is a story about uh, consolidation of uh, anti-reformist uh, oligarch elite, uh, which takes several directions, which find uh, extensive coverage in the media owned uh, by Mr. Pevsky. There are some sacred cows immune to criticism, Pevsky, his party, Russia, here women, Putin, and all Russian political and business interests, uh, the prosecutor general, the prime minister, and their supporters. On the other hand, politicians, media, and civic groups who want to dismantle uh, this oligarch model and uh, who want the reforms are guilty by default. The most serious problem is that uh, all these media dominate the market and uh, with uh, government backing them, they are, they are the megaphone for those in power demolishing uh, any criticism uh, aimed at uh, people in office. 
uh, these media have an advantage over the rest of the other because they receive uh, exclusive information from the Prime Minister, from the ruling party, from the press offices. Uh, the state uh, supports uh, this uh, vicious model also with uh, money uh, from EU funds uh, which are advertised uh, in uh, this media. Thank you very much. Um, Stoyana, sorry. Um, now, I'm, I'm sorry for it keeping you tight, uh, it's just that I think it would be nice if we still have some room for the debate, even if I'm quite dreaming, given the fact that we started with 40 minutes delay. However, I'm now welcoming Anna um, Kuzmanic from H Alter, another media partner in our project from Croatia. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, of course, uh, like uh, all of you, uh, I would agree that nowadays uh, journalism, especially independent one, faces many challenge challenges, uh, like political pressure, lack of finances, bad working conditions, and uh, lack of public trust, and those are one of the biggest problems that journalism f is facing. But I think that uh, we are all, uh, in some kind of way, uh, ignoring uh, problem uh, that is a lack of organization and unity among journalists. Of course, uh, we have journalists and media associations, but I think that uh, they lack, lack power and the will to take real actions and to answer all those problems. First of all, we have a great problem of self-exploitation and underappreciation, which leads to precarious journalism. In those conditions, and without realization that journalism, uh, journalists themselves are important link of chain of professional journalism, we don't have precondition uh, for profession that will have a power to fight against eroded standards, corrupted politicians, and unfair system, and fight for media freedom and right for citizens to be properly informed. All the time we are asking ourselves why citizens don't trust media. I think the answer is simple. We don't have, in Croatia, we don't have uh, mainstream media, including public service, which are independent and re relatively objective because they are following official government politics, because they are paid by big corporate players, some of which own media. And citizens are aware of those problems. They perceive journalists similarly as they perceive politicians. Uh, one big problem when we talk about media ownership, uh, I think it's very important to know who are the real owners and who are the biggest advertisers because they are untouchable and nobody is writing critically about them. For example, in Croatia, uh, company Agrocor, owned by Ivica Todoric, who is tycoon, is the biggest advertiser and the distributor of printed media, and nobody writes about his business empires and affairs that are connected with it. For one example, uh, he paid uh, uh, journalists a trip to Mexico to write about some hotels his um, uh, sister sister company owns. Uh, that is one uh, problem uh, regarding ownership and for me another problem is that uh, journalists are not interested in ownership of media for which they are working for. There was only one newspaper in Croatia uh, where journalists were stockholders that was novelist. Now that, <laughs> that media is privatized. Um, I'm not that optimistic about future of media freedom and journalism if people uh, who shape public opinion don't care about uh, editorial politics, media policy, and representation of public interests. I think if you have a media uh, which is owned by journalists uh, who are real professionals, then you will have a better content and media which is not easily bought. Uh, Mikhailo was talking about access uh, to information. Uh, just one example, uh, we, are waiting, we were waiting for two years uh, for Ministry of Economy to send us a contract with uh, Norwegian uh, company Spectrum, uh, which was um, 
uh, which was um, uh, researching is there a potential of exploitation of uh, oil and gas in Croatia. After two years, we got our answer that we will have a contract soon. Um, also, uh, I would like to emphasize that pluralism of media, especially the private man, doesn't uh, mean a pluralism of ownership and media freedom. Uh, we can see that on example, uh, on example of media privatization in Serbia, and we could see that on an example of privatization in Croatia. First of all, there was no political will to implement uh, good laws that will be in harmony with EU laws. Laws were adopted just pro forma and without real public discussion. Second, new media owners were businessmen that had no real interest to keep those media on level on uh, which they were before privatization and they just became uh, one propaganda instrument for politicals, uh, politicians and donors. Of course, of course, public broadcasters were never independent, uh, objective, and they are still aren't. This is a big problem because it should be serving public. Uh, it should be serving public. Um, that remains one big problem because uh, civil society is. Uh, interested in changing things and they are not organized as well as journalists. Uh, so uh, I would like to say that uh, professional standards are deeply eroded and it's a long-term process the, which journalists were watching and they did so little to stop it. I think if we want real changes we have to unite on all levels like this uh, network, national and international, because I think without cooperation, discussion, and propositions which will be properly addressed, there is no hope for journalism in the future. One good example uh, about addressing uh, problems uh, properly is uh, SU, uh, civil suit, I think, uh, which uh, 29 investigative journalisms uh, brought to uh, uh, European uh, Court in Luxembourg against uh, European Parliament uh, because uh, the, their right uh, to know um, a salary of uh, representatives was declined. So uh, that's it. <laughs> very interesting, Anna. Thank you very much for your contribution. I think that. Um, we are really collecting good uh, inputs on how to move forward and very practical ones. Um, so now I would like to invite Maya Ajusmanovic here and then please, Sead, be ready to, to join us. Oops. Um, hello, thank you everyone. Um, I actually had a few points um, um, directly uh, responding to the the paper, but I'm tr I realize I will change it actually because a lot of what uh, other people said um, completely uh, reflects the state of the freedom of the media in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, at the moment, uh, Freedom House ranked us 108 out of 199, and we dropped by 10 10 places. Um, we're facing the very similar issues, what um, other colleagues mentioned. What I want to stress here is, um, in regards to the paper, you, at one point um, it, it's been very well stressed that um, EU laws, uh, they cannot replace the, the local uh, legislation. In Bosnia, uh, we have almost perfect laws but very, very low implementation of those, and especially in regards to the media. Uh, FOIA has been uh, law for uh, freedom of um, access to information, is there for 15 years, and on paper it's one of the best ones, but still you wait for five or three years for official information. Uh, so it's basically all these similar issues in the region that we, we are dealing with. What I would like to point uh, uh, that we are maybe missing two things uh, in, in, in this discussion is first, um, as we are celebrating 15 years, I mean you are celebrating, um, 
the thing is, um, a lot of things change in 15 years. The world change and the media change. So with this, um, everyone is actually becoming one of those journalists or, or, or mediums for uh, information. So as a um, colleague from Turkey said, we can see civic media and, and online media as, as an opportunity, but with that kind of freedom, there is a lot of responsibility. So on the other hand, I think um, education of all these people who are um, tweeting, Facebooking, whatever they're doing, it's still, th there should be a, a line between, say, a journalist and, and, and a contributor, and a role of someone as my organization, like Media Center, is to, to try to give people um, a basic. So we don't forget about ethics, about fact-checking, about all the journalistic um, uh, basis in, in terms of uh, technology gives us a lot, but we have to go back and, and, and definitely don't forget those. And um, one thing that we also are forgetting uh, is that these information are there for someone. So we do need not to forget the audience. And I think in, in the mass of information and different channels and, and everything that is surrounded us, we are forgetting that um, there are people who are reading this and um, that the level of their knowledge is also something that we have to think about. So this huge, huge area of media literacy as such is completely neglected. So that's maybe just to to think just forward and uh, and as a part of a solution of all this problem is also we need to build new generations of people who are critical towards whatever is coming from from the media and and uh, I think that could help let's say in the future um, I will end up with that actually that's it so far you won the race for the shortest and more efficient contribution. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's uh, Seyad's turn. He is editor of the Macedonian 24 Vesti. Yes, good day to you all. Uh, I'm Seyad Rezvanovic, editor-in-chief for 24 News from Skopje, Macedonia. Well, uh, I am going to speak about one aspect of the uh, paper of the Osservatoria Balkano e Caucaso, uh, which is uh, interesting to me, and that is a stance of the European Union uh, towards the member states and the states and the uh, 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 candidate states and the members. And I think that uh, that is one of the biggest issues and problems which are derivating this problem. Uh, uh, about the uh, situation in Macedonia, Macedonian uh, media situation is uh, very bad. Uh, the media is the mainstream uh, media or all the media who have uh, some influence in the society are controlled by the government. Uh, they are con controlled through various forms, uh, it's uh, financial, financial forms uh, with a, a legal system with uh, the uh, manipulation of that uh, system by the government um, and etc. But uh, today uh, in the open and opening, uh, at the opening of the conference, uh, Professor Palermo said one thing about uh, authority belt which is forming and that belt is uh, beginning from Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, but the interesting part is starting from Turkey, uh, Bulgaria, Macedonia, etc. Uh, the main uh, problem is that uh, only in that part, in those three countries, two of them are candidate states for European Union and one is a member state. Uh, Turkey is a candidate state from for over 30 years from now. Uh, Bulga Bulgaria is uh, 
a member state. So uh, how the European mechanism have uh, 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 how about how those European uh, mechanism uh, has approved for this kind of situation? Uh, the problem is that uh, government in those countries, like the government in uh, Macedonia, have learned to fly above the radar. So they are they have learned that they have to. Uh, vote all the necessary laws. They have learned that they not have to implement those laws later, and they learned that they can break those laws without any punishment. Uh, the interesting situation that uh, government, uh, like the government, uh, those government who are becoming authoritarian, like the government of Macedonia, uh, are point, pointing out to the European Union in their propaganda efforts, and they are saying that uh, they are oft, often uh, uh, reporting uh, the media, which are controlled by the government, are often uh, reporting about the situation in, let's say, Hungary, which is a European state, or some other state, and they are making those those uh, reports in, in its own agenda. I think that uh, something uh, have to be changed in the European Union itself, because now we are in one, how to say, unlogical loop, where uh, we are seeking a solution from somebody who have the same problem. So I, I don't see how, how uh, the someone who is uh, sick from the same disease can help a patient uh, in that uh, way. Uh, there are some positive examples, uh, and I can say that uh, those little of the independent or investigative uh, journalists in countries like uh, Macedonia are helped by the also organization which are funded by the European Union or uh, United States, like you said, uh, various uh, form of uh, of uh, European Union or organization like Danish Scoop, for example, or Osservatorio Balcania Caucaso, uh, and uh, those funds are not big, but they are uh, they are making a huge impact in the societies like Macedonia, because some of those investigative stories which were financed from those organizations have revealed uh, very uh, big uh, manipulation of the highest uh, government authorities. So uh, this, uh, I can say, these funds are not big, but the impact is, is uh, very huge in, in my country. I will... Uh, I will... Uh, and that uh, in this uh, point, in this moment, uh, on the situation of the free press uh, in Macedonia and maybe wider in the world, uh, I don't see a, a bright spot at the end of the tunnel, or maybe that bright spot is very far and very little. And I think that we need uh, structural changes to to have a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Sehad. Um, I hope that as we had this morning, yeah, um, at a certain moment we will have some inputs for hope also. <laughs> but um, now I'd like to call here Matej uh, Jankovic from Radio Student Slovenia. And I think that Kostas, you, you were asking the word. Uh, I'll give. Okay, okay. Thank you. My name is Matej from uh, the country that did not put a fence around, but uh, only technical obstacles. Uh, I come from a radio station called Radio Student, which is a sort of atypical media because it was established as a result of the student uprisings uh, in '69, and uh, it uh, remains to be an institution to which uh, this sort of people are coming, huh? very young people. 
uh, where they learn to become journalists uh, and then go off to uh, a more serious media, although I believe our media is one of the few uh, very serious media in our country. Since I would like to point out, which was already pointed out by uh, Halter, by Anna, that uh, this uh, pluralization sounds very nice, but uh, having pluralization plus the business model uh, where media act on the market just like any other uh, subject uh, brings out, uh, 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 ends up with uh, having uh, media that uh, perpetuates all the divisions that are already uh, perpetuated by uh, various uh, political or uh, other uh, uh, shady groups or how we would call them. Uh, so, uh, there are things in society that cannot be subject uh, 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 to such business models, for instance, pharmacies, we, if I can make a comparison, pharmaceutical research, we've all been uh, hearing for 10 years that we do not have uh, good enough antibiotics because the pharmaceutical industry is not researching it because there's no money in it. Uh, and the same is with media, the, 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 the quality of media is dropping year by year uh, since it's uh, a part of a business model model that doesn't allow for good journalistic work, uh, more so it does not allow for journalistic work which goes beyond the cultural or political divisions uh, 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 within societies. So this is what I think uh, uh, should be a uh, uh, very important thing to ponder upon uh, in the future. Uh, what kind of business models would sustain good journalism? Uh, as for uh, instance, we were talking about also this public uh, uh, access to public information. Slovenia, which is in terms of media laws uh, a very progressive country, has started to uh, adopt laws that undermine this right. For instance, we had a law until now which allowed for uh, the government bodies, for, uh, for uh, agencies, to bill you uh, a bill for the materials. So if you got a, a public information on one paper, maybe you paid one euro. If you got them on 100 pages, you maybe you paid uh, five euros. But now they've uh, adopted a law which uh, bills you not only the materials for it, but also the work of the public servants, of the, of the bureaucrats. So now, uh, <laughs> if, you, uh, if we understand that this can come uh, to a very high number uh, so that again there is not every media that will be capable of paying a bill for every sort of public information they would like to get. Uh, so these are uh, 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 various uh, um, uh, problems uh, that are directly probably uh, uh, mentioned related to the, the, the topic. Uh, I would uh, yes finish because other things are Thank you very much, Matei. Um, now, um, we were supposed to have the intervention of uh, Suzanne van der Zande from the DG Connect. Unfortunately, she couldn't reach us because of uh, flight connections. So I'll be glad to host here Professor Carlo Ruzza from the University of Trento. And then my dream of having a debate might still be realized. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I think your dream is actualized if I am short. <laughs> so I will do my best. Thanks so much. Um, so, um, well, basically I'm a, a political sociologist and I'm a EU specialist. Um, so I know a little bit, but not obviously as much as you do about uh, the situation on the ground. And uh, I, um, I learned a lot from what uh, you had to say. And uh, um, the feeling that uh, one uh, has coming away from uh, your interventions is obviously a feeling of, uh, of sadness in many ways and, uh, and uh, maybe of anger. Um, so the question is, what do we do about that? Uh, and uh, the answer is not an easy answer. What I wanted to say first is that uh, I found uh, a lot of very uh, converging points 
in what you had to say. So the situation is, uh, is bleak, but it's bleak in, in the same ways in, in, many, in, in, in many cases. And, uh, and that means, for instance, the case of laws existing but being poorly implemented. And that is the case of Montenegro, Bulgaria, Bosnia. The case of lack of unity of the journalists and uh, lack of coordination, the problem with ownership and dependence uh, upon um, owners' um, uh, wishes and desires. Um, the importance of citizens' journalism that, however, needs to be actualized in a situation that is politically very difficult um, and it's important to keep the same high standards as, as you mentioned that, uh, um, that are required of all journalisms. And finally, the fact uh, that uh, the EU has, uh, you know, stringent criteria, uh, criteria that, uh, for instance, the Copenhagen criteria have uh, also emphasized, you know, criteria that have been documented not to be really fully um, upheld by civil society organizations, and yet these criteria are circumvented, are ignored, are redefined, as the case of Macedonia uh, clearly pointed out. So the question is what do we do about that? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it is not easy, and it's not easy particularly because we live in a situation in which, um, as Palermo has pointed out, the media is becoming increasingly the arena in which politics is conducted. Journalists are important because they are the voice, the representatives of society in a situation in which parliaments are no longer doing that. Um, we live in a world in which some of the problems you've pointed out are also problems of the West, are also problems of Europe in general, the problem of dependency on uh, owners. And, you know, I'm saying this coming from a country where, you know, there's a huge concentration of, uh, of media ownership, Mr. Berlusconi, everybody knows, but also we could go and, and look at, uh, say, the UK, where uh, um, Murdoch is equally important in shaping politics, you know, through his popular press. So uh, it's not like, uh, you know, a situation that uh, you are alone in facing. It's a more general situation. And it's a situation in which, again, uh, uh, something needs to be done, and uh, we can look in many different directions. One direction you pointed out is the direction of citizens' journalism, but a different direction which is equally important, and I wanted to talk briefly about it, is the role of organized um, civil society. In organized civil society, as an important function at the European level, um, organized civil society, and I'm sad that uh, the uh, communication specialist from uh, uh, DG Communication is not here, but civil society is important because among other aspects, civil society is not only a watchdog, which you pointed out, is not only a mobilizing agent, which you also pointed out, Civil society is also a forum, a civic forum, and within this civic forum, the media can have a stronger and more important uh, aspect and area of attention. Um, I work on uh, EU-level civil society organizations, particularly anti-discrimination organizations, uh, um, as, which are the organizations that work on issues of disability rights, race and racism, um, issues of um, sexualities, uh, minorities, and so on. And each of these different uh, um, civil society groups has a communication specialist. And the communication specialist basically is an expert on media and knows how important it is to mobilize, for instance, uh, society fighting discrimination. Everyone knows how important it is to work as a monitor, but often they don't understand or they don't sufficiently liaise with each other. They don't create that network of journalists working in different areas that alone can act as a channel for those societies that don't have good channels of expression. And so my small contribution to this debate is that uh, the European Union should start to conceptualize communication 
as a horizontal policy. Just like uh, we have uh, formulated the concept of horizontal policies for the environment. Every single policy area should be aware of the importance of the environment. We have done that with gender. Every single policy area should be aware of the importance of gender. And what I think we should do is to realize that because the media is becoming the cradle of politics and democracy, every single policy area should have communication specialists that liaise with each other and that work together to make sure that the criteria that uh, the European Union has formulated are properly and truly uh, supported. And that is uh, something that uh, can be done, that uh, can be done, but requires goodwill and requires support and requires money. Again, the European Union traditionally has created policy areas in areas where they could also benefit as uh, politicians and as bureaucrats and they could benefit the European project. And this, again, is one typical case in which this will be possible in the future. With poor standards of journalism, you also have poor standards of behavior of the European Union as a whole, and you have a lack of legitimacy, you have a collapse of trust, which we all see these days. So this is a win-win situation that should be pursued uh, that is, however, very difficult, as we all know. Thank you. Thank you very much, for Professor Ruta. Yes, um, I had some consideration, but I will open to you. And uh... I just wanted to make. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'm Costas Ephemeros from the Press Project from Greece. Um, I have a specific proposal for the document uh, as an input, because my strong belief is that. Uh, journalism is, is not the answer to the right of people to know, but it's the answer to the right of people to change the world for a better place. And because we all discuss here about uh, this document, I think it's good, it's uh, with my laws and some other proportions about how the find, uh, funding uh, works. I think that in the sentence we say that uh, this lacks demands Translation, uh, transnational information aimed uh, at raising awareness in the European public opinion about, before we, sp we spoke about ourselves and uh, the f problems we are facing, we have to uh, say that how important it is for everyone's, everybody's life uh, the, to, to have the right for access to the information. And it's the most uh, important thing is to understand that people need journalism and we have to overcome this low reputation that journalists has now in the uh, public. That's all. Not... Are there other comments or suggestions from the public? Um, well, um, let's see what's the time. Wow, we still have. 10 minutes, you were very brave. So um, I know that Denise uh, will have a hard job to report all of our discussion, but to me it's quite clear. So I saw some uh, very viable uh, suggestions and also um, points when we were, so the first point that I noticed that uh, clearly uh, the strategy that we should together implement is a multi-target strategy, so um, we, we talked about need to create solidarity um, or to increase solidarity among journalists and to improve, uh, so to provide the journalists with education, for example. So we had journalists in mind as a target for our uh, plan and then uh, also the audience, citizens, both in terms of uh, citizen journalists who give us some hope, as Evren uh, suggested in between the lines, um, but also audience uh, that needs to, to be helped in developing critical point of view through media literacy. And again, also what you cost us reminded us, it's exactly what we try to communicate through this uh, sentence, the missing link, so to help people understand that their rights of citizens to act and to check what policymakers, what public officials are doing uh, is exactly 
results of journalists having the right to access information and to report about facts and uh, situations. Um, we pointed out also responsibilities of the judiciary uh, that it's still uh, very lacking and um, and also this um, focus on implementing existing law, especially uh, freedom of um, uh, access uh, to information. Uh, it's good to have good laws, but we need them to be implemented. And finally, something that to me it's quite interesting in terms of action uh, is uh, to have in mind that uh, policymakers should be our targets, both at the EU level, so when we request the EU, please put more pressure on our governments, um, both as uh, member states and especially as candidate countries, because in some regards what you said, uh, Sead, how can uh, um, ill um, European Union help us as candidate countries to do better? I think that actually you might be more ill than us, but exactly this situation helped us to realize that we need to act together. So somehow, um, okay, I tend to be the positive uh, person <laughs> in the company, but I really think that because of um, previous enlargement and because of the fact that Bulgaria, for example, in the last 10 years of um, uh, well, Bulgaria, it's not 10 years, but more or less, it's uh, since 2007, they are member states and now they are at the very bottom and they, uh, their performance under media freedom indicators uh, decreased so badly. So there's something, um, kind of a, an alarm that uh, is awaking uh, many people around. So maybe we can start from this to... Uh, um, react positively and also what Professor Ruzza suggested to uh, um, to have in mind how structured civil society with the help of the European Union maybe establishing new programs and so we could ask for this and this reminded to me also to possible new business model what Evren said about the fact that Bianet is kind of example kind of business model and it was quite interesting to see okay we are what kind of business model? For, for first, it's non-profit, and second is supported by foreigners, so by the EU, by the Swedish. So probably what we uh, could think is um, to uh, ask for more commitment in terms of and being more aware that the um, international actors, both at civil society level and at the institutional level, has a role to play in keeping an eye, in asking, in exerting pressure and in providing support. Uh, and um, in October I was in, uh, in Leipzig at the first conference for media freedom organized by our main partner here. And it was quite interesting to see the debate between Mr. Elmar Brock so the head of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee in the, in the European Parliament and the president of the Macedonian Association of Journalists. Uh, basically, uh, the president of the Macedonian Association of Journalists was asking for the European Parliament and the European institution to be more strict with uh, the Macedonian government in that case, asking for, you know, um, our government uh, listen more to you then to our society. So we really need you to speak loud and to ask for media freedom and to stick to these requests. And, um, um, and then I saw kind of a, um, a diplomatic answer so, uh, by, by Mr. Brock and I think that we should also work on the side of policymakers, European policymakers, I mean, as European citizens and as um, Mm, to ask them to really stick to their commitments and I think that we should uh, go on um, in this direction. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are um, other comments, maybe other, yeah. I'll, I'll just uh, just want to emphasize what you said the last, uh, the last thing. Uh, by giving an exam example, uh, until uh, maybe October last year, 
uh, our prime minister was publicly attacking all of these media and civil society I was talking about earlier uh, by calling them uh, media mafia, rats that should be deraticized, uh, state enemies, publicly, almost uh, every, every week. And uh, in the last progress report, which was published in October uh, 2004, 14, actually the, the one before the last, which was because one of the one is released this year, uh, there was a sentence which says that uh, uh, public officials should uh, sustain from uh, making statements that uh, make uh, the hostile environment for the media. And since then, she never said he never said anything like that before. So. That pressure is obviously working, and that's if, of, although uh, uh, if, if we lived in the democratic society, or if my, my state, my country was a democratic state, for every uh, uh, every interfering from abroad, I would tell everybody to go uh, themselves. But uh, but th this is one of the tools which is not used used uh, as much as it could be used. I mean, although uh, it looks like we we asking for the foreign protectorate, no. But this is the this is one of the main main issues that should be uh, should be uh, took upon the uh, the uh, that should be. Uh, we should make pressure to the European officials to do that more and, and more and more, I mean, harder pressure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's half past five. Um, so I don't know, we could be the, the best of the class and uh, uh, close our workshop and move to the other room for the closing remarks. I can give a last chance to someone if there is someone other people uh, wishing to comment. Okay, then thanks to everybody and let's move to <laughs> the final closing table. <laughs>